Hello. This is the first of three lectures on Chapter D from Miguel Roig Francoli's book, Harmony in Context. In this and the next two lectures, I will be talking about chords, specifically about triads and seventh chords, and I'll be talking about the quality of those chords and also how we indicate inversions of chords. To get started, I'm going to share my screen with you and show a picture uh, that's in your textbook in chapter D. This is example D.1a. This illustrates the idea that there are both horizontal and vertical constructs in music. This is a short chorale harmonization by J.S. Bach. The melody that you see here in the top line, which goes is a chorale tune. It's a uh, German Lutheran hymn tune. Mr. Bach has written chords to go along with this tune, and the chords are moving at the same rate as the melody. And each of the chords that accompanies one of the melody notes includes the melody note in that chord. So we can understand this music in two different ways. One way is by looking just at the horizontal lines. Let me once again play that top line. I'm going to play only halfway through, only up to this fermata. So here's the top line. This is what we would call the soprano line. Below it, still in treble clef, but a little bit lower, is what we would call the alto line. In the bass clef, the higher of the two parts, the ones that the part that has the stems going up from the notes, is the tenor part. It sounds like this. And finally, the lowest line is the low line in the bass clef, which has the stems going down. This is the bass part. And you can hear that each of those lines by itself is a satisfactory line, and it is singable and somewhat memorable. It's really a melody all unto itself. We can then also understand this music by looking at the stacks of notes. Each of these stacks of notes is a chord. So the first chord is this. The next chord is this. The next chord is this. The next chord is this, and so on. Let me play you the entire example D.1a and try to listen to it both horizontally and vertically. Try to make your ear hear the separate lines and also make your ear hear each individual chord. The next chapter in the book will take up the idea of musical texture. Um, you could think of texture as being kind of like a textile, a cloth, which is woven from horizontal and vertical pieces. Think of how a cloth combines threads that go this way horizontally and also threads that go this way vertically. And so a, a, a cloth is sort of woven together like this, and that gives us a a textile, um, and in the same way, a musical texture is woven together with horizontal and vertical aspects to it. 
Let's turn next to example D.1B in your textbook. This is another musical example, and here's what this sounds like. In this example, the chords last for much longer than they did in the previous example. You can see that this F major triad, FAC, lasts throughout measure 23, 24, and 25. Then we get a new chord. This is a C dominant seventh chord or major minor seventh chord, C, E, G, B flat. It lasts throughout measure 26, 27, and 28, and then we re return to the F major chord. Here we can see the melody, again, consisting of notes, this time notes plural, that are part of the underlying chord. The melody here goes from F to C to A to F to C. All of those notes are in the F major chord. Then here, with the C major minor seventh chord, we have some notes that don't belong. These are called non-chord tones, and we'll take them up in chapter six and a little bit in chapter F. Um, but here's a G, here's a C, an E, a G, a B flat, a C, and a B flat, and these notes are all part of the C dominant seventh chord. And then we return to the F major chord with the A being a part of that chord. So this is a different type of musical texture where the horizontal lines and the chords have a different relationship to each other, but it still makes a satisfying piece of music. Finally, let's look at example D.2. Example D.2 explicitly shows us different ways of presenting a chord. A chord is a group of three or more notes that sound together or that sound in a melodic pattern where you can understand that they belong together and create the harmony. In example D.2a, we have stacks of notes and these notes really do sound simultaneously. So we would have D major, G major minor seventh, D minor minor seventh. Letter B shows a way of writing a succession of three chords, but using broken chords or arpeggiation. So C major, then G major, and then C major again. Here's another chord progression. This has A major, E major, and A major. And yet another melodic pattern for the broken or arpeggiated chords, we have D minor, then G minor, and then D minor. One more term that I'd like to introduce you to using example D.2 are the terms consonant and dissonant. Just as intervals can be consonant and dissonant, so can chords be consonant and dissonant. A consonant chord includes all consonant intervals. So this D major chord here at the start of example D.2a is a consonant chord. It has a major third, 
D to F sharp, a minor third F sharp to A, and a perfect fifth D to A. All major and minor triads, and we'll define those in a minute, are consonant chords because they have major and minor thirds and a perfect fifth. The next two chords, however, are seventh chords and they include at least one dissonance. In the G dominant seventh chord, there is a seventh from G to F, and that's a dissonant interval. Also, there is a diminished fifth from B to F. So there are two dissonant intervals, and that's what makes this a dissonant chord. It doesn't mean that it sounds bad. It just means that it sounds unstable. It wants to go someplace namely it wants to go here and the D minor seventh chord here is also dissonant because there's a second from C to D just one dissonant interval is enough to make a chord a dissonant chord all seventh chords by definition are dissonant because they have at least the dissonance of the seventh or if it's inverted as it is here they would have the dissonance of the second Let's look again at these two types of chords. I've shown an example of each on the board. Um, a triad has three notes, and a triad can be written in this form as a stack of thirds above a note. So here I have a third from C to E, and then another third from C to G. A seventh chord is also made from stacking thirds, and here I have not only the C, the E, and the G, but I have another third going from G to B. Um, so a seventh chord, if it's complete, will have four notes. Um, a triad, if it's complete, will have three notes. And these chords can be presented as incomplete chords in music. That's very common. We refer to both triads and seventh chords as tertian chords. These are chords that are made from stacking thirds. The word tertian means having to do with thirds. There are four different qualities of triads. These are the major triad, written with a capital M, the minor triad, written with a lowercase m, the diminished triad, labeled with a little circle, and the augmented triad, labeled with the plus sign. These, of course, are the same symbols that you used for diminished and augmented intervals and for major and minor intervals. Again, make sure that I can tell the difference between your capital M, which should be tall and pointy, and your lowercase m, which should be shorter and maybe have three little bumps on it instead of just two. The major and the minor triad are both within a spanning interval of a perfect fifth. So from C to G is a perfect fifth, and that's the interval from the lowest to the highest note of each of these triads. A major triad will have the major third on the bottom and the minor third on top, whereas the minor triad will have the minor third on the bottom and the major third on top. A diminished triad has the spanning interval of a diminished fifth, hence its name, and it's made up of two minor thirds stacked on top of each other. And the augmented triad is made of two major thirds stacked on each other so that the spanning interval is an augmented fifth. As I recommended with intervals, where I said that you should first learn very securely the qualities of the white note intervals and then think about what happens when you add accidentals, I would likewise make the same recommendation with the triads. Learn the triads that with natural notes are major triads. There's another group of triads that with natural notes are minor triads. And a, a, a single example of a diminished triad that you can make with the white notes or natural notes. So CEG is a major triad. FAC is also a major triad, and so is GBD. Once you have a major triad with white notes, we can change 
different notes to make the triad a different quality. For example, if we make the third a lower note, we've now changed it into a minor triad. Or if we keep the third as it was, an E natural, and we make the C sharp and the G sharp uh, raised notes, this is another minor triad. Or if we keep the C natural the same and we lower the other two notes, that makes it a diminished triad. Try experimenting on your own and see what happens when you add different combinations of accidentals uh, to a major triad such as C major, F major, or G major. Remember though that you can only use major and minor thirds. If you pick a strange combination of accidentals so that you're making diminished thirds and augmented thirds, there you're not really making uh, a valid triad. Minor triads like D minor, again, have the minor third on the bottom and the major third on top. D minor is a minor triad made with natural notes. A minor is also a minor triad made with natural notes. And so is E minor, e.g. B. These are all minor triads. If we take a triad like D, D minor, we can make it major by raising the F, making it an F sharp. Now we have a major triad. Or we can make it major by keeping the F the same and flatting the D and the A. That's also a major triad. We can take this minor triad and make it diminished by flatting the fifth. Or we can make it augmented By sharpening the third and the fifth. I realize now that I'm using terms that I haven't defined for you, so let me go back and do that. The three notes of a triad have specific names. When a triad is stacked up like this so that it's a stack of thirds, the lowest note in the stack is referred to as the root. And that's the note that gives the triad its name. So this is a C major triad because the root is C and the quality of the chord is major. The note of third above the root is called the third. That's pretty easy. And the note of fifth above the root is called the fifth. Also pretty easy. So when we talk about the root, the third, and the fifth of a triad, that's what we mean. In my next lecture, I'll be talking about triads as they occur in major and minor keys and we're also going to talk about the inversion of triads. What happens if the root is not the lowest note of the chord?